Hi everyone, welcome back. This week I'm going to talk about something that's a little bit more challenging. And of course, I want to share the good, the bad, and the ugly with you guys. So this week I'm exploring or thinking about something that was brought to me yesterday and am I a hypocrite or am I giving advice that I don't myself follow? And this came up with my husband, Richard. He's currently going through something with a friend of his and it's his best friend. And I tell him like, because I can see him very clearly, right? So I give him the advice and I always share the perspective of the other person as well because I'm neutral on it and I can see both sides of a, of a situation. And in the case of this relationship with his best friend, there's a lot of like, on Richard's part, a lot of hurt feelings because this friend of his isn't really um, following through on calling him back or like says he's going to do something and then doesn't, says he's going to, um, whatever, do like, I'll call you back tonight and he doesn't. And so we were talking about that. And basically I was saying that, well, first of all, he called me a hypocrite because he's like, you know, first of all, I don't feel like you're taking my side. And I said, well, there really isn't a side. There's a, like, if you, take this step back, you have, you don't know what's going on in his life. So you don't know what, what, you know, he's going through and you're taking like the wounded, like how you would as a child, like you're, it's triggering a wound in you, which is making you feel terrible. Right. But really what this is bringing up in you, regardless of if he's present in your, your life right now is for you to heal this wound that's clearly bothering you. And he was like, I don't, you know, I feel like you're very easy to give out information or give out um, uh, ideas for healing things. But when I look at your life, I feel like you're failing miserably with your relationships with other people. And I was like, you do? And he's like, I do. He goes, you know, like with your mom being here, I see you guys get into it all the time. And I think you're mean to her. And I think that, you know, I don't see you holding that like bigger perspective with her. And I was like, you're right. But here's why. My mom moving back in with us to me is a blessing because it's bringing up and all of the hurt past of my third dimensional self, mainly like, let's say as a child, as an adolescent, as a teenager, the relationship, our relationship dynamics. And I'm going to give you this example. The other day I just went off on her because I felt like I was the only one doing the trash. Like our the way our property is, like you don't just bring the trash outside. Like we have to drive it up to the top of the the out of our property to the street. And I was feeling like every single day or every other day I was the only one that was doing it. And so I was like, "Mom, come on now. <laughs> you see it's full." I'm not the, like the person that should do it every day. Like, not that we need to make a schedule, but come on. Like if it's, it's, if it's full and you're driving out, like take it with you. And at, when I unleashed this on her, I didn't realize, like I was just in full on ego, like defensive, not wanting to be taken advantage of and wanting just kind of exploding without consciously understanding what was going on. And once I let it go, I felt like, okay, I said it. And now here's the thing. That energy had been building up in me for about a month. And it just finally was like, that's it. And the reason I was like, that's it, is that I had taken the, like, brought the trash out to my car that morning. And I was just about to leave to bring it up to the top. And right before I left, she came downstairs with her trash bins from her room and her bathroom and just dumped them right in the the new bag that I just put in there. And we have this kind of trash that's like these side-by-side ones. So it means like there's a recycle and a regular trash, but that means that both are way smaller than a normal size trash bag. So that's why we have to take the trash out all the time. 
So basically the the bag was now full again. And I was like, really? You see that I'm bringing trash up. Why wouldn't you just put your stuff in a bag so I can bring it up with me or whatever? So I unleashed it and, and, and she, I know she was surprised by it, but essentially I realized a week later, what was actually happening is I'm trying to establish boundaries with her and I'm trying to like almost like regain an equal equilibrium in our relationship as adults versus me as a child living with her would have just been the one that I have to do the dishes, I have to take out whatever, having chores in in the household, let's say. And it, it feels like it was heading in that direction. And I had to say like, no, dude, you're an adult. I'm an adult. Like we're both here. We're both contributing, like, like help out. And I didn't know how to do it consciously, meaning like having that adult conversation. So what happened is I reverted back to my child self that just blew up. Right. And so Richard's like, yeah, you're failing miserably at how you're dealing with her. And I said, you know why? It's because my my wounds are the ones that are speaking for me in the moment, right? I'm not like being able to go like blow up a bigger picture and see the perspectives and say like, okay, this is how she's being, this is what I where I would like this to go and how do I navigate her getting there? <laughs> that would be like a fully enlightened person, you know, doing the work, I guess. But the thing is, and this is what I was trying to explain to him, is that when we're triggered, we revert back to our lowest um, dimensional self for a reason, because all of those past hurts or past like misunderstandings or where you felt like you weren't seen, they're coming up because they want to be expressed in a different way, right? Or resolved in a new way where you, you feel like, I can't live like this anymore. I mean, I'm so grateful to have my mom here, but I can't revert back to my childhood self. And I mean, if we look at this in terms of like going home for the holidays, that's a huge trigger for every single person because why we revert back to our roles that we played as children or as, you know, adolescents in that family dynamic. And so when they come up, they're going to come up in that way, because that's the only way that you know how to communicate with that person. So in my case with my mom, it it blew up. Like it was like, uh, (laughs) and so I said, you know, what's interesting is that you see it as failing miserably. I see it and I feel it as once it's released, maybe I didn't handle it right, but once it was released, it was now there was a, a talking point, like it was something that was brought to the light and now we can like converse about it. And then fast forward a week later, I actually said, mom, that wasn't even about the trash. This is what it was really about because now I had time to sit, step back from my anger about it and to say like, this is what I really was feeling and it just came out in, in the form of the trash bag. <laughs> because The thing I know, even with healing, is that whatever the symptom that you think is the problem, it never is that problem. It's always just the trigger that's trying to bring up the energy of what created the problem, which my mom is super, um, like, I've called her like a type A personality. She's loud. She is like boss lady. (laughs) Like, she is um, just the dominant. So between me and her, Uh, she wins every time. Like, I'm just going to be quiet and sit there and not say a word because I can't, like, I can't find that balance. You know, I can't, I'm not going to go out of my body to try and match that um, masculinity. And I, what I instead do is revert back to a more feminine, like kind of (sighs) repressed part of me, which I know I need to work on, right? but it blows up because I don't know how to, how to express it in a, in a healthy way. So I said, where you see, say I'm failing miserably, that's a judgment on a relationship that you're not a part of where I feel like it's a process. Like I'm now, I think we are about two months in of her living here And I feel like so much gratitude and gratefulness that she's here because it's bringing up those like last, like dense little pockets of me that want to come out, you know? 
And the other day, she got a, oh, a, a letter. I think it's from Social Security. She's at the age that she can start collecting on, um, I guess, Social Security. And so I said to her, does this mean you're going to move out? Because it's basically doubling what her income is and and maybe will help her get back on her feet easier. And I, But I said it like, like right when she sent, she sent me a text with the letter and I had this feeling like we're finally like, um, like we're finally dancing, you know, (laughs) like we're finally like everything feels like it's flowing right now with, with our relationship with Richard, with every, everything. And here she sends me this letter that I thought, Oh, does that mean she wants to leave? So I said, I went over to her room and I knocked and I said, does this mean that you want to leave? (laughs) She's like, why do you want me to leave? And I was like, no, I feel like we're just starting to talk. Like we're starting to communicate on a on an even level now. So I know I don't want you to leave. And she's like, good, because I'm not ready to leave either. So I was like, okay, great. So now I feel like instead of me failing miserably at it, I can, and I was trying to explain this to Richard, is if you have to go through the messy process to find that new relationship with the person that, let's say, you're wanting to work that relationship with. And he was like, oh, because he looked at it like, I saw you lashing out at her, so you're not practicing what you're preaching uh, to me. And then I explained to him, of course, for anybody that's outside of the actual dynamic, it's so much clearer for me to see what actually is happening between him and his friend and try to give him the bigger perspective. But when you're in it and you're the one going through it, you're going to fail. You're going to like revert back to your old ways. You're going to be a mess about it. And that that's nature, like that is the process. But then, so I would say giving yourself grace when you're in it. And then once you can, like, take the breath and bring it back down, you can see the bigger picture and then have the like more neutral conversation in this case with my mom. So ha- telling her like, look, it wasn't about the trash bag. It was just about, I was feeling like we were unequal again and you were dominating over me and I didn't know how to say that. And so she's like, oh, okay. Well, then she said, well, I feel like this is your house and I don't want to um, like do anything unless you ask me to, or you say you need help with this or what what have you. And I was like, interesting. And I and then Richard asked her, does that mean that like, for example, you would change things or you would move things around? Like, what do you what do you mean? And she goes, well, yeah, like, for example, in the kitchen, I would move things around. And I told her, Mom, I don't care about any of the stuff in the kitchen. I don't care if you feel like something would be moved better, move somewhere else, do it because I'm not attached to that. But I am attached to us having like an equal balance here. Like I am not here to take care of you and and like, you know, unbalance in an unbalanced way. And she was like, okay, okay. <laughs> and so, and then bringing it back to relationships with friends, I, I was trying to explain to Richard, like, <sighs> can you just feel what this is bringing up in you? Like the hurt, the, the, the feeling that you can't rely on this friend anymore or that you guys are changing. He's got his own things he's going through and you're going through something totally different. And maybe they're just not meeting those, those threads aren't meeting anymore. And it, there is in no way, it's no, not possible that he's intentionally hurting you because he loves you. And, and then I gave him the example of when my best friend just moved, um, I guess it's been a lit, like a month and a half ago. <sighs> I don't know if I really talked about this, but, you know, it, we don't have a ton in common, but she's just always been that, that like rock for me or that I call her my blankie. Like she makes me feel safe and I just, I don't have, like, I don't have to be on for her. You know, I can just be myself and like a total like chilling on the couch and not have to entertain her. Like she'll go in the kitchen, get her own stuff, like whatever, you know, like that friend where it just is. And I've relied on that feeling with her and my relationship since I moved back to California. So when she left that first week, she drove cross country. She moved to Rhode Island 
um, she didn't text at all. And this is her. She's not good at texting. And I know that. But I remember that first week I had to like really check myself because I wanted to, I was like feeling so hurt by like not any pictures, not any like, hey, we're in this city this week, nothing. And I was like, why are you making this about you? Like, she's on the adventure of her life. Like, let her live her, you know, and just try to be supportive of where she's at. And I said to him, and I never told him this while it was happening, but I said, you know, that first week that she was gone, it I was in so much pain about it because I was realizing I was losing a big part of myself. But the bigger perspective is that it's time. It's time for me to put my blankie away. And so I said, kind of the same of what's going on with you and your friend. You have, and and he's known this friend as long as I've known my best friend. So it's like from childhood. And I said, what if this is happening because you're ready to like open up your heart to new friendships that actually you do have fun with and are on the same page. Like he's, he loves riding his got vintage motorcycles and he's like joined all these motorcycle groups and he has now a group of friends that they go and do these weekend trips and whatever, you know, it's, it's a, a like-minded activity that they have fun together. And I said, what if you just embrace the actual flow of the energy that is coming in and and instead of being like, well, why isn't he doing this? And why is he not following up with me when he said he would? Because you're like pushing against flow, right? Flow is when someone's ready to leave your life or not on, not consciously, like they're mad at you, but they're ready to flow into their own experience and it's no longer, you're no longer part of it. Can you let that just go and let, and be supportive and loving? And as those emotions are coming up, maybe in the moment you're going to be hurt, but then like sit with it. And I said, you have to let that emotion come out because if you just shove it back down and like, I don't want to deal with this, I'm going to blame him about what I'm feeling, then it's just going to come back around in the next like relationship or the next month that something happens and you rely on him again and then it doesn't happen. And, and he was like, hmm. And I said, so instead of like <laughs> calling me the hypocrite, you kind of have to go into your own process. And I said, and if you don't want me to, to give you the, the things that I see from my perspective, I'll, I'll stop. I don't, I'm not trying to, um, you know, make you feel less than, or that I have it all figured out because no one does like this just isn't my particular lesson. I can see yours because I'm not in it, but when I'm in my own, I'm in it, (laughs) like I'm in it. Uh, but you have to give yourself the grace to be in it and understand like for different people, it's going to take them a different length of time to process it and get through it. And he was like, okay, I can, I think I can see that. And he's like, yeah. And, um, calling you failing miserably at your relationships is not fair. And I said, the other thing is that there are relationships that I have that are no longer in my life. And I said, you could look at that as failing miserably, but the way I feel it is I've left the door open for hopefully a reconciliation at some point. But I also know that I'm not going to make that person meet me now because they can't, you know, like this would be like in the case of, of if his friend, like, why aren't you calling me back? You said you were going to call me back and you didn't call me back. Like what's going on? That friend is probably going to be like, what? I was at the gym. Like, you know, like it's nothing to me. So me forcing a relationship that's not in flow is not going to heal it. I have to like allow each person to go through their own process, no matter how long that takes. And I think the goal is that, can we just hold, again, I go back to, can you hold your center while the person is going through it? And maybe it will never come back into your life. And is that happening for a reason too? Like with the case of me and my best friend, as she moved away and I grieved that, I feel like I'm more open to and deepening the relationships that are more aligned. And even in doing that, I I find more depths to myself that I know would not have come out had it, I stayed in that like close knit, comfy, blanky situation. And it all is exactly how it's supposed to be. So 
you know, it's a process. I don't feel like now this is a day later and I've really thought about what he's had to say. I don't feel I'm a hypocrite. There is one thing that has happened um, where I said to someone that um, she was asking me or saying to me that she felt like she was ready to teach. And I said, oh, I don't think, I think you should find your center before you step out into that place. And she, I didn't, in the moment, she didn't really react until a couple days later. And she said, you know, I was really hurt that you said that to me. And I was like, you were? Why? And she's like, well, basically you're telling me that I'm not ready. And I said, no, what I said is you need to find your center. If you teach from other, other people's like chaos, then you're going to just bring that chaos and amplify it out. Versus if you're centered, you're going to be able to hold space for people. And no matter where they are, you can stay centered. And she goes, well, you know, do you think you're centered? And I said, no, this is, this happened about maybe seven or eight months ago. I said, no. And that's why I'm not teaching. Now, in hindsight, I should, I, I don't know in, with this particular person, I felt that I could and that I felt safe in being that straight up with someone. I've never said that to anyone before or since because I can see how my perspective in and even if I can see it in a, in a in a in a soul and that they're not fully centered and embodied at that particular time, is it my place to say it? I think now having these months go by it's not because let me say, like, if she would have decided she's ready to teach and she goes and teach, teaches and she pulls in these energies that are interested in what she's teaching, that's their thing. That's what they're here to go through and experience. And it probably would have been a line because she would have pulled in the energies that needed that energy. But in the time, I was just so caught up in my own process of... I know I'm supposed to do this, but I'm not quite there yet. And, and, you know, like the, they're kind of contradicting energies and I knew I wasn't centered. So how can I put, push something out that isn't from that aligned place? Because that's my story, you know, like that is what I feel, but that isn't everybody's story. So in that, I think, um, I wish I would have handled it differently for sure. And I wish that I could have just held her no matter what, that she, whatever she wanted to do, but I wasn't there, you know, <laughs> I was not there at that, at that particular juncture, but even that, like I've learned in this particular relationship, I, it taught me a lot about myself. It taught me how to set boundaries after that all happened and also Allow, um, allowing me to understand that just because I let someone into my physical experience, I still need to hold boundaries with people. I, my, <laughs> I would say my presence, I go into people's energy pretty f easily. And a lot of the times like it's welcome, but sometimes maybe it's not. And I've learned since then, I, I stopped doing that. Like I will only, if someone asks me a question, then I'll go in, but I don't just solicit or offer advice. Okay. With Richard or my mom, maybe I do. <laughs> That's a, a little too close. But, um, in the case of friends, I'm not doing that anymore. I realize like everybody has to go through their own process <sighs> and I wanted to talk about this this week because you can see that the message is that even if I feel I am centered now, man, there's still things that will come up and, and, and people will be able to mirror things to you that you're like, wait, <laughs> I missed that facet of something that I'm going through. And I need that, like that we all need that. Like the people that we're in relationship with are those exact mirrors that we actually need in order to see our crevices that we wanna just gloss over. Um, I'm bringing this up today too because, again, I don't know, I feel like the last three weeks I've been saying this, but there, I feel like things are getting denser 
in my house, uh, my mom is talking about politics again. <laughs> and I just on the fringes kind of know a few things that are going on. And I just want you guys to know that this piece about getting to your center is going to look messy. It's you got to let it be messy, but focus on your process. The more that you're giving your energy to these outside stories and scenarios and I guess political arenas or whatever, it's throwing you right back off your center. The only way that you can work on your shit is to go into the shit. Like (laughs) if you're distracted It's just keeping you outside of your center. It's keeping you outside of how you get to that place of like calm, cool, collected. The whole world can be burning down to the ground and I am going to rise. I am going to be totally fine. If this is my day to die, I am centered in that moment. I am present. To me, that is where we're headed. And, you know, essentially everything that is coming or that we need to break down systems that need to break down to be rebuilt, it's going to be messy and it needs to be messy. But if everybody is in that mess, who's holding the space or the light for something new to be birthed? You know, and I, I mean, I've talked about this so much about distraction and clearing the distraction And actually, I don't know if I talked about this with you guys yet, but the way they showed me this the other day was, I think back in the 50s is when the television set was um, created, right? And there was just one per household, if you're lucky, and it was a black and white one, maybe it had three channels, and everybody would sit down as a family unit and watch one show. Well, if you think back to that time versus where we are now, the amount of light that has come down into this planet since the 50s is immense, right? And the veil has thinned so much that it's turned on so many people that then that one television that used to sustain our attention, let's say in the evening hours, has grown to holding a phone with you at all times for that distraction. And they just showed me like, that's not a mistake. It's it's literally the more light that comes onto the planet, the more distraction that's needed to keep you from that light. And I was like, oh, well, that makes total sense. I mean, I'm, I'm the same way. That was why I got off social media because I couldn't control the mindless scrolling, you know, or the mindless like checking in on other people's lives through their photos and what have you. And they said that if you're not in that person's life. Looking at their photos doesn't make you a part of their life. Even giving them the thumbs up doesn't make you a part of their life. So where does the energy go that you're giving to that experience that's, they're not feeling it and you're not feeling it. So it's literally like, I would say the the actual mechanism of the phone is using that energy and it's going somewhere. So when you think about that and and you want to have sovereignty over every part of your threads, like knowing I'm intentionally giving energy to this part of my day, to this, let's say, video that I'm watching, to this movie that I'm watching, to whatever you're doing. If it's done with intention, then there's no leaks anymore. The mindless scrolling is the leak Or like if you can make it in this place of like going to Vegas and just seeing those people sitting at the, um, what are they called? The machines. They're just checked out. They've got a cigarette in one hand and a drink in the other and they're just pushing that button. Where is the energy going? I I, I don't know why this is coming through, but essentially that like tipping point or that balance point is so like, it's like a teeter totter every single day. So as these denser energies like come to the surface, the more centered that we can be to hold where we are, you know, and understand and give grace to other people where they are without needing to give your energy to it. That's going to keep that, the, the game of light 
a little bit higher. I mean, it's going to be this teeter totter for a long time, but I feel like having that little bit of tip up on the light, it's going to help the processes of everyone collectively. And I know it's a process like God, like the distraction thing was coming into my field for probably at least six months before I started taking action on it. That distraction is going to look different for every single one of us. So understanding what your yours is, your thing that you just like, like for me, uh, you know, with social media, but also I would say it's sugar. <laughs> so whatever that thing that you really don't have a, a handle on, that's your point. That's the thing that you're ready to like start to investigate. Why is energy able to leak that way through you? And then it's just being graceful with yourself and understanding that it's a process and trying to bring that consciousness to that point as as often as possible, right? Maybe it's daily and then it gets down to like a couple times a day. Then it's like every hour, what's happening here? Um, I think that's going to help everybody and and not just your process. It's going to ripple out to the collective because the more con- energy that is like not being siphoned out to these darker or denser realities, they don't have the juice to amplify it, right? Like if you think about uh, the news channels, it's like they can talk for hours and hours about one subject because, they, you know... I, uh, that's what I'm talking about. Those kind of conversations need energy. And the only reason those news stations do it is because people are tuned into that stuff. So what I'm saying is pull back and then we would have less of that. Um, so I hope that th- this is helpful. Um, and just try to have grace for yourself. I'm trying to have grace for myself as, you know, being called these names, <laughs> And not taking it personally and being present to work through where my perspective was, I believe helped to, Richard to see a different side of me versus like him judging me for giving him advice and not following my own advice. Like we're all human. We all are going through our own tough shit right now and allowing and having the grace for others to do the same is where I think it is. So I hope this is helpful and I'll see you guys next week.